my manga Apple Black is published in stores worldwide. And I used Clip Studio Paint to create pretty much everything you see. So shout out to Celsius, the creators of Clip Studio Paint who are sponsors of this video for me to bring you a full breakdown on how I make manga and how you can too. We'll do one colored page, one with screen tones and a double spread. Note that I've been using Clip Studio Paint for many years now, and it's definitely my favorite tool to use, especially when it comes to making manga or any form of sequential art. There's been a new version of Clip Studio Paint version two with a whole bunch of features, some of which we touch on in this video. So keep watching. Shout outs to Celsius, the creators of Clip Studio Paint for partnering with me to bring these videos to you guys. They're big supporters of the channel and what we do here. Big love to them. You can currently get a free trial of Clip Studio Paint yourself so you can follow along in this video. There's a pro version and a more in-depth EX version. In this video, I'm using the EX version. Here, assuming you have some storytelling techniques, you take your story, narrative, plot, treatment, synopsis, whatever you want to call it, and we convert that into a script. Get all the key things that happen in your story in the best way possible and convert that into narration and dialogue or monologue. Usually my synopsis treatment thing before it's converted into script is a mess. Usually I'm the only person that can read it. Since I'm a one man army when writing this, I'm the only one that gets to see it. It's very chaotic, but I make sure to write everything that happens so I don't forget. And then I just convert it to script. How your scripts can look could be in the traditional sense of how a Hollywood script will look or screenplay, but you write what works best for you. I tend to split it into pages. Some people tend to split it into pages and panels, which I also recommend for starting out. I split mine in odd numbers because I know where the page is going to start, even though I may add the even numbers too, if I already know exactly what goes where, or I want to be extra organized off rip. So I leave room for freedom when storyboarding between the ones and the threes. Page one starting on the left, so that means page one and two would occupy the whole spot, giving me that much freedom to freestyle when storyboarding. And then three just means a page flip, and you're building tension up until the page flips. You want to keep your reader engaged, and the tension is there to make them keep flipping the pages before they know it, the book is done. There are all kinds of techniques that come into play when storyboarding, and I have several videos that go into detail of all that. You can find links to my Gumroad where you have templates for everything that I use in this video, pages, storyboards, script, and sample pages. They can also look through as you're watching this video. Because of the script, I know how many pages the story is gonna take, whether it's a chapter or a full story, whatever it is, I know how many pages. I know where the double spreads are, so I can take my storyboard template and then rearrange it to fit. Again, the storyboard template will be available in the Gumroad along with all the other templates I use for the manga pages, the script, and sample pages, and then some, all in my Gumroad. The templates help me stay organized, especially during the storyboarding phase. Go up to edit and then change canvas size to play with the settings here to reorganize things, but you can do this for any canvases you have. When it comes to how to lay out the pages professionally, there's a lot that goes into it, knowing where the text should be, knowing not to have art too close to the edges, knowing what the gutter is and how to stay away from it and how to use it to your advantage for double spread pages and so on. That can be its own thing. I have older videos that break this down, but there's a newer one on the channel. You do not need all of that to go on in this video, but it's something to keep in mind. We will proceed. I can kind of move the canvas to the side and I have the window with my script behind, however you have your script. And they kind of go hand in hand. As I'm working on the storyboard, it is influenced by the decisions made from the script. But sometimes while storyboarding, I might get some ideas that make me go back to the script and change things like dialogue, certain actions, certain scenes. So they work hand in hand, but it always starts with the script, at least for me. And I think that's the best way to move forward. On this first page, knowing when to use the establishing shot to let us know where the characters are, introducing characters for the first time. So the first time we see these characters, I make sure there's at least a panel big enough to give us a good shot of the character so we're really introduced to the character for the first time or in some cases we've been introduced to the character but we're seeing them again it's good to see them fully or at least from head to torso and in this case from the script we're jumping in mid battle with a character dodging an attack and then revealing the other character who attacked who are also going to introduce in similar fashion which is cool because then they have another character on their back that's also kind of getting introduced it's a little tricky but stay with me I figure out the speed lines, where panels are going to go, how they're going to cut, 
which panels are more important than others. The more important panels get more room. If it's action oriented, we do the slants for the panel gutters. Some panels bleed, some panels don't. And when storyboarding, I also have notes on the side that remind me of things to watch out for while doing the actual pages. If I don't make the changes already right there and then. Like, oh, the camera should be tilted or flip this panel, stuff like that. Again, things happen where you go back and forth by making changes on the script because I got an idea on the storyboard. This fluid workflow is highly recommended. The cool thing about Clip Studio Paint is you can select some of the illustrations or the sketches, reduce the size. It's much easier to storyboard digitally than on paper, which is what I used to do. So Clip Studio Paint kind of makes it easier for me. There are many ways to select, shortcut M for the marquee tool, and then you have a lot of sub tools that you can use to select. After a selection, Control T or Command T, and then you'll be able to kind of transform and move things around. But right now I'm storyboarding four pages. You also want to make sure that you don't have too many panels on the page. I try to keep it clean. A good sweet spot is four to six panels per page, but you can really do whatever you want. But sometimes the danger zone is really once you start to edge towards like nine and 10 and 11 panels on a page. Maybe you want to give the panels room to breathe sometimes. So you might have a page with just one panel. And sometimes there's room for 10 panels, but you really need to know what you're doing. There should always be a focal point. You don't want a case where someone's looking at a page and it's so chaotic that it's overwhelming and you know they might not want to read anything. Make sure it's consistently pushing the narrative, building tension each time, or at least giving the reader a reason to keep flipping the pages. Page three and four here is going to be a double spread. And again, this comes with knowledge of understanding double spreads and how they work. I have all the pages numbered. Everything is organized. Panel three in this case is what extends from the left side of the page to the right side of the page. Sometimes on the side, I'll give myself little tiny illustrations that are better versions of what's already inside the little sketchy panel. It's a good tip that prepares you for the final drawing when the time comes. In fact, some cases I'll just draw the panel again outside of it and just draw an arrow pointing to where it's going to replace. Bottom line, someone's getting attacked. He stops, they have a little back and forth. He sends an attack, they counter, and that's what these first four pages are. And now it's time for a proper setup for your whole story within Clips to Your Pain. Go to File, New, Comic settings. The file name right there is comic. I will change it later, but you want to give it a chapter name or whatever, whatever you want, some kind of file name to let you know what it is rather than just leaving it comic. These are the page settings and dimensions that I use for Apple black. All the volumes follow these, but under presets, you can see other dimensions used in Japan from Shueisha, Shonen Jump and so on. Kodansha, the list goes on, but to follow the tutorial, just stick with mine. Down at the bottom, once you know how many pages it's going to be, you put that in there, but don't worry, you can always add pages later on. Left binding just means it's going to be read left to right. And then you decide whether the story starts on the left page or the right page. Make sure it's page to page, but if you're working webtoon or a manhwa or just a comic, manhwa, manga, whatever, with a scrolling reading format, then you change that. Since we're shooting for print, we'll leave that as page to page. And then you see everything all laid out. Clip Studio Paint with this makes making comics so much easier, much more organized, especially when it comes to exporting as we'll discuss at the end. Then for the part that's gonna be a double spread, just right click and combine pages. You can always right click and split pages if you made a mistake. Here I'm just doing it all over again and this time I'm putting the name that I want because this is gonna be the first four pages of chapter 33 of Apple Black, volume five's first chapter. Then when you double click on a page, it spreads out. I make sure the canvas with my storyboard is out. I pretty much use the marquee tools to select it. Control C or Command C to copy and then paste on the actual page and then blow it up. I do this for all the pages. Once I have it there, I put it at the top. I reduce the opacity. You hit shortcut U twice to give you the option to create a panel. Before we actually draw a panel, follow the settings on the left. It's always nice to have the panel lines be thick, anywhere from 15 to 20. At the top where you hit view, you want to make sure that it's able to snap to ruler and special ruler. That way the panel will snap to the guides. But when cutting the frame, look at the settings again, and you want to make sure that the horizontal gutter is at 150 and the vertical gutter is at 50. This is an industry standard thing and it helps for better reading of the panels. Everything looks more organized. Go look at your favorite manga. The more vertical gutters in between panels are always thinner than the more horizontal ones. Then you want to cut the panels according to the storyboard and that's just cut frame here. Frame is just a panel. Call it whatever you like. Obviously you don't have to follow these rules to a T, but it's good to know the rules so you know you're breaking them if you want to. Also before you cut, you choose between divide frame folder or the divide frame border. Divide frame folder just means that every time you cut a panel is going to create an another folder 
that's essentially a mask for that panel. And anything you draw within that folder will remain within that folder. But if you use divide frame border, then all the frames slash panels will share one mask. I tend to stick with folder because it's more organized that way. As I'm done doing it to the second page, the double spread is a little trickier because when you open combined pages here, it creates a mask for each side of the page with the folders that you see. But what I do is I just work above both of those and completely ignore them because nah, I'm gonna do my own thing. Same rules apply, but this time there's a whole frame that I'm just gonna completely delete to give me that room of gutter on the lower end. One thing I want you guys to keep track of this whole time, after I'm done cutting the panels how I want, I'm renaming them in the layer window so everything is organized. So layer one, two, three, I know exactly where each thing goes and they're ordered according to the panel that you read. So panel one is the first panel you're supposed to read in the whole spread or the page. Also, while you're on a frame folder, if you hit on shortcut O, it will give you all these anchor points. If you want a panel to bleed to the edge, you just hit the arrow and it'll automatically bleed to the edge. You can actually play around with the panels even after you've cut them. But if you're following along, kind of like an observational tutorial, you'll either already know this stuff or you can just see me do it. How to know what panel bleeds to the edge and all that, that comes with experience of knowing how to panel. I usually use that for the more dynamic panels where action is happening. How, when do I cut panels with a slant? Usually for similar reasons. And I usually keep things a whole lot more organized and clean cut and non slanted panels for the calmer scenes. But if everything is more chaotic, I want that to be reflected in the way the panels are cut as well. This is something very common in shonen manga. That's a very huge influence of mine and my manga Apple Black. And sometimes for some panels, remember when I'll draw a different panel on the side and the storyboards? In some cases, I'll go to the direct panel and just copy and paste just that cutout. Replace it when need be, because trust me, it's very easy to forget it. Always look back and forth on your storyboard to read all your notes and make sure you're not forgetting anything. So first, when I have everything laid out and the panels cut, I take the text from the script. For comics, never use Comic Sans. I know it has the word comics in it, but take it from me, it's ugly. Which of your favorite manga, comic, whatever you want to call it, that uses Comic Sans. None. Why? Because we all agree it's ugly. There may be some purposes for it and maybe places where it's suitable, or maybe you just want to break the rules for whatever reason. But generally speaking, don't use Comic Sans. If you're curious to what I use, I use Wild Words. Anime Ace is another good one, but I have several videos that go into deeper detail on lettering, what fonts to use, how to letter, all of that within Clip Studio Paint that you can also check out on the channel. But for now, I'm just putting in the text in the places I know they're going to be. This also lets me know how big I want the text balloon or text bubble speech balloon, whatever you want to call it, or how big I want that to be. In some cases, there isn't going to be a balloon. Sometimes I want the character to be saying these words in their mind. And you can either have a thought balloon where it looks like a cloud, or you can have nothing and then give it maybe a white stroke. And in order to give text or literally anything on any layer a stroke, you go up here to effects, hit that circle button, and play around with the settings for what color you want it to be, how thick you want it to be, up to you. But I usually give a thickness of 20 stroke color white for text that's just a thought. And I can also play around with the fonts. Death Rattle is another really good one for a scratchy look, maybe because the character is really angry or yelling. You have a lot of freedom to do whatever works for you. Shortcut T for text. When it comes to the size of the fonts, they could be whatever you want them to be. Just make sure it's legible. I never go below nine point. Just from my experience, anything lower than nine points is treading the lines of being unreadable. But you can always go higher, maybe to echo the volume of the character, maybe. The bigger the point, maybe the louder they're saying it, or maybe you do that according to the importance of what's being said. This is what happens if you don't have keep aspect ratio ticked on. Once you're done laying down all the text, if you hit shortcut T again, it'll give you the options for the balloon. You just click and drag, you play around with the settings. Again, before you even click and drag, you want to make sure the brush size is pretty thick. I always don't go below 15. And then once you've picked the shape you want in the subtool, you then use the balloon tail to create a tail. You can have it be sharp with straight, spline with a bit of a curl, or a thought to echo a thought balloon. You can see there with the balloon, it gives you a whole lot of options. Again, I have a video on how to letter comics with Clip Studio Paint. If you want something that goes into super detail, but the good thing about Clip Studio Paint's UI is that everything is pretty self-explanatory. As long as you're trying to experiment, 
it's very easy to learn and pick up. I didn't go to Clip Studio Paint School to learn any of this stuff. All that being said, I usually just draw my own balloons. If you understand layers, I have a layer, whether it's a raster or a vector, and I just create the lines for the balloon, echoing the natural touch that you would see for the most popular manga out there in the world today, where the creator actually creates their own balloons. So I tend to do the same. Just know if you're gonna do it with a vector layer, you would have to create a separate raster layer to fill in with white or whatever color you want the balloon to be filled in with. But I just use one raster layer, I create the balloon, cut it how I want. You can hit Control T to select everything on that layer for transformation. Right click for free transform and then you can alter the balloon however you see fit. And then on that same layer, I just make sure I fill in the balloon with the color white if I haven't done that already. A neat trick to toggle between the colors is to hit shortcut X and then shortcut C is for clear. Keep in mind when you hit C, but whatever tool you're using, brush, airbrush, pen, when you're drawing on the canvas, it's almost like you're erasing. There are other tools here with the balloon pen that you can use to draw the balloon. Similar to what I was talking about before with my own raster layer. It even makes it easier to add a balloon that's connected. Balloons like these are great if you want the reader to be able to pause while reading, giving the dialogue a little bit more character and also room for the reader to breathe rather than having one giant balloon with a bunch of text shoved into it. There are also balloons that you can pull from the material. You hit this icon, you go to material, experiment with everything that's there, but under, under balloons, you can click and drag. It'll give you this option with vector lines and within these vector lines, you can actually play around with the tool properties like so. And then if you're on thicker and you identify how much thicker you want it to be, you can go over those lines to make it thicker, giving it a more natural look that you would get from a traditional G pen, which is a more industry standard tool used for inking in Japan. If you want to make it thinner, you just hit narrow, the list goes on. Everything is pretty much self-explanatory. Vector lines essentially just create a path. If you create stuff with a vector line, you can always go back and make the lines thicker and thinner. In this case, when you pull from the material folder, the lines are coming in vectored. But this technique actually works for any vector lines. But again, I create my own balloons manually because that's what works for me. Key thing to remember is knowing what works for you. You don't actually have to use every single thing just because it's there. But it's cool to know, for some people I know for a fact, it probably speeds up the workflow. Here I'm gonna throw in a little chibi head because there is no balloon tail and I want it to be very clear who's talking. And I'll try to make the little head be expressive to also help sell what's being said. Watch out throughout the whole video. You can see me change a lot of the dialogue here and there. Cause again, nothing is set in stone until publication. Boom. Same rules apply for the sound effects. I create them manually, but there are materials that have sound effects there as well. You pull it in, it creates its own layer. You can right click on the layer, convert layer, and then change it from colored to monochrome or grayscale if you don't want it in color. But again, None of this matters to me because I create my own sound effects manually. If you want a dry brush effect, you can get that brush or a brush that's like it for Clip Studio Paint, or you can use a literal dry brush on paper, scan it in, get the PNG of just the sound effect, import it into Clip Studio Paint and use that. But I keep it simple and do my stuff manually. Maybe I'll give it a stroke here and there and make sure to label it SFX, keep things organized, and I go from there. If you notice, I'm going step by step. The first things I'm worried about right now Script, storyboard, put on page. After all that set up, create the panels, cut them, put the text, the speech balloons, sound effects. And once I've done all of this for say a whole chapter, I feel so much more prepped to finish the chapter. And this is also taken into consideration that you already know what the characters in these storyboards look like. In some cases when I don't, or I haven't settled on one yet, I might have like a finalized sketch, even on the storyboard on the side, or you can have a character design sheet ready to go. You just do whatever works best for you. But ideally, before you start working on the actual pages, you wanna know exactly what the character looks like and you wanna make sure you're done with all the assets and concept art. So you also wanna know what the place and environment looks like. It helps you storyboard even. Character design, concept art, all this stuff is something I'll make sure I have done right after the script actually because it helps you while you're thinking about how you want the pages to be laid out how you want the camera angles for the panels to be and all of that it's much easier to storyboard a scene if you truly understand the environment where the scene is taking place and if you know what the characters look like
And now it's time for the inking. Now, normally you can have a layer for a sketch where you have a detailed sketch based off of the rough lines from the storyboard. And then you have a new layer for the inking. But one of my secret tips to save time is you have your rough, your less rough, and your fine. If we remove the less rough, you save time. Now this is not easy to pull off. You actually have to have some experience and a decent understanding of anatomy and just drawing in general. But I do tend to save a lot of time using this method. I have a separate video on working on 150 pages, knocking them all out in about 100 days, even though I did have some help with my amazing manga assistants. This is a little neat trick that I have. You still have clean lines making it work. If you look at traditional, very popular mainstream shonen manga that's out right now, especially little ones that have to be out on a weekly schedule. Just know that depending on your style and depending on how confident you are and how purposeful they are, you can really get away with a lot. If you look at a lot of Jujutsu Kaisen or Chainsaw Man, you can see that. And obviously they have manga assistants and you can see that difference in art style with the way they work on their backgrounds because the backgrounds are usually handled by manga assistants. Now you can have backgrounds handled by somebody else and since everything within Clip Studio Paint is all digital, somebody could be working in the background elsewhere. And once they're done, you can just import it. There are other neat tricks you can do when it comes to backgrounds that we can put into Clip Studio Paint or create some from 3D stuff. But I can have future videos that go into more detail about all of those. For my manga, I actually had a more detailed sketch sent to manga assistants. They would then work on the backgrounds and send it back to me. But in this video, I'm going to be doing it all myself, both for the colored page and the more traditional look. This first page, since it's gonna be in color, there's a lot of stuff I'm just leaving to line art and just clean line art. It's all in the wrist and you wanna make sure you have very clean, smooth strokes. Don't be afraid of making errors. Control Z or Command Z is your best friend. As well as all the other neat tools and tricks that Clip Studio Paint has at its disposal that we would explore further. If you notice, I have the character pop out of the panel. All this is, is just having the line art on a separate layer above the frame folder layer. And then I have another layer in white used to create a silhouette so that it stands out and pops above the frame folder. It's all layer trickery. And here for the following pages, I'm inking slightly differently because here it's not just the line art I'm worried about. I'm also now filling in blacks and shading more and all of that because these pages are not gonna be in color. I didn't do all this stuff in the previous page that was going to be in color because I know I was going to knock out some of those rendering with color. But here is just going to be filled in with blacks and a couple of screen tones here and there. For speed lines, there are a million ways to do speed lines in Clips Studio Paint. One of the quickest, neat, tricky ways that I'm going to show in this video. Again, if you want to see more, let me know in the comments below and I'll make separate videos on these. But I'm going to use the perspective guide. And for that, at the top, you go to layer, ruler frame and then create perspective ruler. You then pick the vanishing point you want to use, but for speed lines, I tend to use one point perspective. When you have one point perspective, you place it where you want it to be. Once you hit one point perspective, hit okay, it creates a perspective layer for you. And while that perspective layer is visible, everything you draw is going to point to that vanishing point. So you want to place it where you need it to be. If you want to move it around, hit shortcut O while you're on the perspective layer, you see anchor points that you can move around. Here, I want the speed lines to be pointed, not at the character, but kind of in the direction where the character is moving, especially in the floor area, because that's where a lot of the blurry motionness would be. If there was a camera following this character, the character will be in focus while everything else will be blurry. And that's what the speed lines are trying to mimic, especially on the floor. So you put it where that blurriness is going to be the most. But in a way, the lines are all kind of pointing to the character, drawing the reader's eye towards this character. When doing speed lines, you want again, clean strokes, thick on one end, thin towards the vanishing point. And I try to have the lines pretty thin, maybe 15, and then they kind of go in twos where two lines are closer together, maybe twos and threes and fours, but I give them a little bit of room. There are a million ways to do this. I highly recommend you go look at your favorite manga series and study their speed lines. The little space in between the lines to make them seem natural versus all the lines being evenly spaced. Those look ugly and very mechanical. And then sometimes, even though for this colored page, we're not gonna need to do it as you will see later on, but sometimes I would then create a new layer that's just white to go in between the lines of the character and the speed lines. So the character and the speed lines don't overlap. This way, I'm not actually erasing the speed lines. They're always there behind this white in case I ever need them again. Another way for speed lines where everything is parallel, you can use the ruler tool, shortcut U, 
and you keep hitting shortcut U until it gives you the create ruler where you see the linear ruler, curve ruler, all of that. And then you make sure you hit special ruler on the subtool and then change the special ruler to parallel line. Here, I'm just gonna select the spot where I want it and I'm just gonna give it the same vibe where the lines are not equally spaced and they do exactly what I want. Key tip is to make sure you're doing this on a completely new layer. If you do this on the same layer you were using the ink, it can make things a little confusing because it will change the layer type. You don't want to mess with that. I like to do it on a new layer, call it speed lines, so that if that layer then gets changed to the special ruler type layer, that's what it is anyways. We don't have to mess with it. All of this is behind the text and the text gets to pop. That's why there is a white stroke around the text because the character is just thinking. That's why those words are not in speech balloons. So you want them to pop and not get lost in all of the lines. I do the same thing for the lines here. One point perspective. I have all these projectiles popping out of the arrow that the character shot. And then I have a separate layer just to make them stand out and make them pop. That's in between the line art and the speed lines. I have the sound effects. Again, with my sound effects, I use onomatopoeia, which is just made up words for the sound. But most of the time I use exclamation marks. And the exclamation marks are just a way for the Ready to kind of make up the sound in their head, whatever they feel is suitable. And then maybe the size of the exclamation marks are an indicator of the volume maybe. And that's kind of been my style of the ways I've approached things for a long time. And then real quick, you can also see this beta flash thing. Sometimes you use it for characters when they realize something really shocking, or you can use it here. It all depends on you. You just need to be able to justify whatever decisions you make. Remember all of this stuff you're not gonna learn in one video. Practice makes perfect, or at least, almost perfect or just good then i have a little neat trick if i'm trying to save time one of the material for focus lines i just drag it in i make sure i rasterize it once you drag it in it creates a layer you right click that layer and you hit rasterize that way you can transform it if you need to but right before you do that you rasterize then select it and then you go up to edit transform and then mesh transform that way you can bend it to your will and have this really cool curve effect i do this if i want to save time really quickly and I think it fits the scene with what the character is doing. If the lines are too thin, you can duplicate the layer and then merge them both. Just select them both, right click and hit merge. That's a little neat trick I use to save time. Or you can actually create curve lines with the fish eye. It's the same thing with the perspective. You just wanna make sure you're on three point perspective. Just make sure to turn on fish eye before you hit okay. You do that and then you get all these anchor points. And I think this is one of the best additions to the new version of Clips Geo Paint. I'm definitely going to be finding myself using this more often. You can select the word and you just change the color. Here I'm changing it to white and then giving it a stroke of black. You can also see me using a Babis font here. And I tend to do this for characters. Maybe they're doing a spell incantation for a move they're about to use in the series. It just helps things pop a little more. Sometimes they're in a speech balloon. Sometimes they're not. Maybe they're thinking it because sometimes maybe they say it in their head. We as the reader, we get to read it, but maybe no one else hears it. It all depends on what I'm going for for the particular scene. But that's all I'm doing here with the text stroke. When inking fast in my new technique, I don't always nail it. Sometimes it helps to draw, even if it's a loose sketch. Sometimes that helps. If the anatomy is really complicated, especially for stuff like this, where the character is not just by themselves. There's another character hanging on to them. And so it just helps me think about things a little easier and maybe it even saves time because there are some times where I'm trying to just nail the anatomy head on and it's taking more time than it would normally. So it makes things a little bit more at ease using this approach. And then I fill in the gaps eventually. And even then, if you don't nail it, while on the ink layer, you can just select the parts you want, Control T or Command T to transform, right click to free transform or whatever transform you wanna use. And I just make the adjustments because what I notice is that the other character bending their knees, if you imagine them standing fully straight, then they'll be much taller than the other character, which I didn't want, meaning that I had drew him a little shorter than he was. So I made those adjustments and filled in the gaps. Another way to do this in Clip Studio Paint is the liquify tool. You hit that tool, you make sure you're on the appropriate layer, the layer you actually want to adjust, and then you adjust accordingly. Now you can actually adjust multiple layers at once. You just wanna make sure all the layers are highlighted and to highlight those layers is to select the layer, hold command or control, and then click on the next layer you want to adjust. Sometimes you can put it all in a folder and then just click on that folder and then use the liquify tool and it'll work. It's a stellar addition I'm gonna be taking advantage of for sure. If you notice there are tones in here, even the tones are going to adjust. 
So I'm just painting the background. I usually have reference of what vibes I'm going for. I get it from Pinterest or Google Images to really nail what I'm going for. I color in the sound effects how I see fit. Usually give a nice gradient. I use the fill tool to maybe even change the line art of the sound effect. You just want to make sure you're on the right sub tool. Shortcut G for fill. If it gives you gradient, you just hit shortcut G again and it'll give you the fill tool and all the other options to come with. Again, I can have separate videos to go into more detail of those. I have a playlist for Clip Studio Paint and we can continue to add to it. Y'all just let me know. I have a separate layer for the skies, giving it that nice blue gradient, separate layer for the clouds, separate layer for the mountains. We got some atmospheric pressure going on, so it's gonna be soft, might even reduce the opacity a little bit. Separate layer for the bushes to mimic the trees, the forest, all the, all the fun stuff. Then I have the explosion, hence the boom. And I'm also gonna give that a bit of a motion blur, which we'll touch, touch on a little bit. But this is just fun painting new layers for different blending modes, maybe a linear burn and then an airbrush for a dark blue, mimicking the blue of the sky, but in the lower parts of the forest and then the upper parts a little bit opposite, maybe a blending mode of add or add glow and then a warmer color to give that sunlight type vibe or reduce the opacity so it's not too harsh have more painting for the character moving. It doesn't have to be detailed because he's moving, so it's gonna be blurry anyways. And even after I'm done doing that, I can select it all. I can add some filters and effects. By selecting it, go to filters at the top, blur, motion blur, and then play around with the settings and the intensity and make sure it's in step with the speed lines to really help sell that sense of motion. I do the same thing for the smoke here. I gotta change the angle a little bit and change the intensity because I still want to sell that sense of motion, even if it's subtle for just that dust from all the action that's happening for this battle. I tend to stay away from completely black speed lines. So on that speed line layer, you hit that button and then you can change the color. I'm going for something lighter. Put on the Ross Draw hat for a warm color with the color dodge. And we're just having fun painting. Here we're just adding the flats. And I usually have a layer called a flat for each frame folder and I just put in the flats accordingly. Now you can still do things that you guys maybe have seen in previous videos of mine where I have a separate layer for the mood or tone to make the flats fit the environment. So it's basically another layer that might be clipped to the flats with the linear burn, reduced opacity, and a dark hue that's in step with the environment, but then reduce the opacity. It also helps sell that 2D animation cell shady vibe. But again, it's really up to you. Right now, I'm just focused on laying down the flats. You can see what I'm talking about here, playing around with blending modes to really make everything feel a little bit more dynamic, cinematic, and it comes with an understanding of blending modes, adjustment layers, and all of that, and how to play with that in Clip Studio Paint. I have several videos that go into more detail on how to color in Clip Studio Paint so you know exactly what's happening. But you can also follow along, kind of like an observational tutorial. If you slow the video down, you see what I'm clicking on. And I'm treating each frame like its own illustration. Every frame, a painting. And now for the other pages, we're just doing it in regular screen tones. You could select the spot. When you select and click your paint, it gives you these tools at the bottom. You hit new tone, but if you don't want to use those, you can go to material under monochrome and basic. You can click and drag. Once you click and drag, you can then play around with the layer properties for increasing the lines, the frequency, density, to make it fit what you're going for. Maybe even change the shape play around with all the other materials that are in there, or you can select, hit new tone, play around with the settings there. Once you hit okay, it creates a new layer again. And on that same layer, you can draw with other tools and it's still going to, and it's still going to mimic that same tone. Notes that if you've already created a tone layer with this method and you have the same settings trying to create another one, it's not gonna create another one unless you tweak the settings a little bit. Here, I just tweak the angle and then it'll create a new one. Again, this is trial and error and then you understand what's happening. But like I said, when you create a new one, you can draw on that same layer and it's just going to mimic that same effect. So to save time, what I did, and this is part of the templates that you find on Gumroad, because I have all these tones in my manga page template with the frame, with the tone, with these guides and these colors telling you what parts are gonna get cut off and print, or most likely to, every printer is slightly different, where the gutter is for a left page or a right page, all of that. One of the folders has all my tones already created Therefore, when I'm on a tone layer, I can draw whatever I want. Just turn off the guide because it's in the way. Now we see it clearly. I separate the one, the tones that I'm going to use for things that I want to have toned on clothes. 
maybe character skin for black skin, CTS, objects or things that you want to draw attention to or close to the screen, hence CTS, certain patterns I tend to use often. All of it's created here. Even when you draw and you still have all the material that always comes with Clip Studio Paint no matter what, if you select a spot and pull certain material in, it'll create a layer as it comes in. You can take a pen tool, brush, whatever, and just kind of continue. Not every material works the same way, but it's fun for you to find out. I have a noise kind of tone for trees, but there's, but that's what I used to do before. Nowadays, like we saw earlier, I use a combination of the vegetation brushes in white and black, white for highlights and the black for the shadows, then manually draw the rest of the tree. But on the template, I have all these tones in a tone folder. I just click on the folder, Control C or Command C, and then I paste on the respective pages, pretty much all the pages, I make sure it's above all the frame folders. That way it's actually gonna be seen and not lost or fixed to just one frame. It'll be above everything so I can use the same tone layer for the whole page. And this saves me a lot of time. So here for the character's skin, I'm having it filled in. But then also I'm going to CTS it because again, I wanna draw attention to his smile. There's no backgrounds here, just focus on his smile, the little smirk. And this is also a common thing you find in other shonen manga as well. Sometimes they won't CTS the character's teeth or eyes, but I tend to CTS the whole thing. Yeah, I'm also deciding to fill in the character's hair, black. The tone layer called clothes, that's for filling in anything that has to do with clothes. And I do it this way to stay organized. So even though his glove is black, the highlights are there, and you see this again in other manga, I'm gonna fill that in with tone. And the setting already is at 30 for density, which I think is appropriate. But you guys can always go ahead and increase it to 40 or whatever you want. But once we're settled, we just go on toning where we see fit. One something to think about is how you're actually going to tone. There are many series out there that don't have any tone. There's some series that tone just a little bit. There's some that tone a lot. It's really up to you. Example here is I wasn't sure how I wanted to tone the hair. If I wanted to just tone it, completely fill it in black, or do something a little bit more textured, which is what I'm doing where the hair is black, or enough contrast to be seen as black in this form, but I'm gonna leave some highlights to still keep the texture in it, and that's what I'm gonna fill in with tone, probably with the clothes tone layer. Since they're in the forest is a perfect example of me using the tree brushes for foliage, leaves, and all of that. I already have like the roots and the branches and all of that drawn out, but in black, I'm just filling it in, and I'm doing this on its own layers. It keeps things a whole lot more organized. And then I'll go in with white, not transparent with shortcut C, but an actual color white to show some highlights and make any adjustments here and there to make it all fit. This is the perfect panel to use some material that help evoke a similar emotion. Even anime do this obviously, but maybe in color. But here I'm gonna find one of my favorite ones, very radiant. And I'll just put it in the back. You select it and then you click and drag from the material. I do simple gradients. You can obviously do things that are a little bit more elaborate, but I do very simple gradients. I select the parts I want. Again, shortcut M for a marquee tool. You can use the selection pen. Any way you draw is just going to be selected. However you select it, it's up to you. You can even expand the selection so you don't miss a spot. Because sometimes people will select things and fill and you see little tiny holes where you missed and they have to go manually fill those in. You can just expand the selection by one where necessary. But however you select it, shortcut G, foreground to transparent for the subtool, and then I just do the gradient. Or you can manually do the gradient with an airbrush, shortcut B. Keep hitting shortcut B until you see an airbrush and maybe a soft airbrush. With the effects, you can actually change it to a tone gradient and then play around with the settings. But in my approach, that's not necessary. I also use the gradient to create clouds, use the gradient for the sky, and then with the combination of shortcut P for the pen, shortcut B for one of the brushes, you can then create a cloud either on a separate layer with white or on the same gradient layer, but then shortcut C for clear to in a way kind of scrape the gradient to get that effect. Completely up to you how you do it. Obviously I'm not doing a cloud right here. I just wanted to do almost like an abstract thing going on and then using the clear the shortcut B till decoration under hatching to gauze cloud and then clearing out the bottom. I have another video that goes into extreme detail about how I tone, when I tone, how I tone the sky, water, fire, 
all of that that I highly recommend you guys watch is a previous version of Clips to Your Paint, but again, the same rules apply. Here, I'm doing the gradient thing again, but then I'm erasing parts that I don't want. I just want like a silhouette of trees in the background left, and then everything else can go. Pretty more gradients on the glass on the character's mask. A gradient here as one of the characters shoots off all those projectiles because I want the actual ding, 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 ding to show up. I'm going to put a gradient behind everything and then erase the points of impact. A newcomer with the new version of Clip Studio Paint is the Shading Assist. At the top you hit Edit and then you go to Shading Assist. I can see this is something they keep improving year after year. They'll probably come in very handy for people to do like ongoing webtoon and whatever the case may be. Using the colorization and the Shading Assist, they can come in very handy. So you go to Edit, Shading Assist, change the settings for what kind of shading you want, day, night, whatever. So you just move that cursor around and you see how it's reading the character. So freaking cool. You can change the light source type. You can change the shading type and the blending modes of each of them. That bar, it actually shows the opacity of each of the layers. This is definitely a fun tool to play with. But just know when you're done and you hit OK, if you look at your layer window, you'll see it's created these layers that are clipped to your drawing. So in a way, it's just kind of shading how you would normally shade for a 2D cell shading. And there are many cases where this would make things faster and easier. You'll still need to do some editing to it to nail it, but it's a nice foundation. For this drawing though, we're going to be doing it ourselves, doing it manually. And you just create a layer. Maybe you have it clipped to flats. Reduce the opacity, change it to blending mode to the one you want. For me, it's linear burn. Some people use overlay, multiply, and so on. I'm using linear burn. I'm picking a hue that fits the environment. And I'm going to do this for all the panels. You might actually do the same thing, but for highlights, but instead of linear burn, maybe you do add or add glow, reduce the opacity again, and maybe a warmer color, and then you put it where you want highlights to be. And I do this until we are done. Now lastly, it's time to export. File, export either single or multiple, batch. You can tick off right to text, this way it exports a text file that has all the dialogues. And stuff like that can come in handy for maybe a separate person that's lettering your work. It maybe has to be lettered differently or if you've lost the original script, whatever the case may be. Below that, you get to decide what pages get exported exactly. You can also decide if you want the combined pages split or not. And in most cases, you want them split, especially if it's going to be in print, because in print, the double spread pages are going to be treated like they're separate. And at the top, you decide where the files get exported to and also what file type. You want to make sure text is ticked on. Sometimes you want text ticked off so that there's a version of the pages without any text, making it easier for translations. There's more to it than that, but those are the basics that you need to know. And after that, you're done. Much easier than going to each individual page and saving and exporting. You can export it all at once. You can even export it as a PDF. So much you could do. Didn't even touch any of the animation tricks you can pull off in Clip Studio Paint. And now obviously if you want a double spread page together, you wanted a version of both pages combined, you can go to that individual page and either save it manually or export it, but this time without splitting the pages. It's up to you. And just like that, we've made a comic from start to finish with Clip Studio Paint. You can also see a 3D preview of how your manga is going to look in print form. All you have to do is go to File, Export Multiple Pages, and then 3D Preview for Binding. And then voila, you can flip the pages, zoom in, zoom out, turn it around, tilt it, do whatever you want. But it's a great way within Clips of Your Paint to envision your vision. These are all the pages exported. For the two and a half people that made it to the end of this video, I thank you. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Hit the bell so you stay notified each time I upload absolutely anything. Follow me on all social media. Check out this next video that's going to help you on your journey to making your own manga.